Hello, I'm Louise Rowe and welcome to The Sheer Luck Show. Today we are chatting work and careers from the juggle to have it all to working with family or friends and advice for turning your side hustle into your main hustle. But first, let me introduce our wonderful guests. I'm joined by investment banker and author Rebecca Arderton Davies and Veronica Swanson Beard and Veronica Miele Beard, founders of the ultra stylish, one of my faves, clothing brand Veronica Beard. Welcome, ladies! Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Oh, okay, so you just here. landed this morning, yeah. or you landed last night, yeah. from the East Coast. Yeah, from New York. How are you feeling? Good. You look amazing. Lots of coffee. <laughs> Hair and makeup does wonders yes. for my mood. But no air conditioning. <laughs> no. It is hot. Yeah, it is hot. Um, but welcome to London. Thank We're very you. excited Thank you. to have you. We love being here. It's so nice. Yeah. And um, Louise is the OG. Veronica Beard supporter from I am. the very beginning. I am. Thank I you. I feel like I met you. Mm, when did the brand launch? 13 years ago. 2010. Oh my gosh. Well, congrats mm. on that, first of all. I want to dig Thank in. We've you. had a bit of back chat already, and you are, in fact, still full time yes. job. I'm full time investment banker. Um, I have a, a senior job. I've been doing it, you know. I've been at the firm I'm at for 14 years. I've been in the industry for 17 years. Yeah, and I, I as I tell my bosses, I have no plans on leaving. I have love life and writing books and all this stuff, but I really like my main job. Yeah. And you and lockdown, you started doing yoga on so, Instagram. Yeah, but like way pre lockdown actually. So I got hit by a van cycling to work uh, oh, no. back in 2013. Um, it was, I was very lucky in the grand scheme of these things. Like I broke a collarbone, hurt my shoulder. Um, and like six months later, couldn't really lift my arm. I was like, oh, I'm 20 something. This should, should probably do something about that. Um, and so started doing some physio, but like did the classic thing of never, yeah. you know, I didn't do any of the homework that the physio set me because yeah. who does that? Um, and at the end of the session, she was like, you should really do something that gets you moving. And so yeah, started yoga, um, started like, you know, doing it sharing a little bit of it on Instagram because that was the kind of new thing at the time and the whole thing ended up very strangely taking off and ended up with 150,000 followers on Instagram oh my uh, a couple of years later. What kind of yoga is this? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I was just, I love like dynamic vinyasa yoga um, and, and look, you know, I had a uh, pseudonym, I was kind of very secretive about what I did. You kept it on the DL from work? Yeah, yes. I told work, work okay. knew, okay. but I was very uh, secretive outside to you know on my platform about what I did and where I worked but I talked about having this big career um, and how, like fitting yoga in in the seams and so I wrote my first book um, that came out in 2020 that's about independent yoga practice it's called the book of yoga self practice and that I published in my real name um, and the conversation that sparks at that point I was a managing director I'd had my first son um, you know, yoga, Instagram, books, da da da. Everyone was like, "Well, real whoa. underachiever." Here. Yeah, <laughs> and job. Yeah, like, how are you? How are you doing it? How are you having any work-life balance? And like, and this and the book is about you know what is wrong with work-life balance as a mental model, um, and the mental model with which I think we should replace it that I call the dials. So it's called shifting the dial. Yes, and work-life balance, super binary, super arbitrary, super oppositional. Um, Work is not one thing, life is not one thing. Um, and you know, none of us are living like in this static way, right? Life changes, seasons of life, um, opportunities, opportunities and needs vary a lot as well. Um, so the DARS framework starts with the dashboard. This is like your foundation, your priorities, your goals, your values, like you know, the things that are important to you in life, family, financial stability, work, adventure, kindness, impact, whatever it is. Um, then on top you have your dials, you know like my work dials, each of my sons is a dial, my yoga practice, the Peloton that I haven't been on this year, you know, the different parts of life. And then a dial is meant to be adjusted. There are special needs and opportunities in life. You dial things up, you dial things down, you can be responsive. I, my hope is the dials framework, um, you know, dashboard dials levels, and then kind of wrapping the whole thing in resilience is a different way of thinking about the problems that I think all of us are facing. I love Amazing. that. Thank you. <laughs> I practice yoga three times a week. Oh, you're doing better so, than I am at the moment then. So I love, love, love yoga. And it actually definitely keeps me um, sane. And it is a dial that I have to crank up a lot. It's it's really good. And it's one of the kind of like the resilience things I talk about. Like there are dials that you can put on your dashboard that you should have on your dashboard mm -hmm. that like keep you in the game. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not always, you know, like work or even family. Like is it yoga? Is it time in nature? Mm. Is it right. um, like rest? I've started reading novels again. Now I finished this, uh, finished writing. And it's just like such Manicures, an additive. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. But it's true though. Yeah. It no, does it's make you so feel true. like your old self if you've lost yourself a bit. Yeah. What do you got? Okay. So between you both, you've got eight children. 
a very successful, incredible business. Thank and you. do you have any other tips or things that help you navigate this huge juggle is, is one word for it, but it's not easy. It's not balanced. Do you know what I no. mean? Do you guys have any, you know, there's coping? this quote, um, Natalie Massonet was mm. interviewed years ago and I can't remember what it was in, but I read it and it was right when we were starting Veronica Beard and it just felt, you know, at that point we were so, we were so new. The business was being run out of my apartment. It never ended. It felt like this constant loop. We had little kids, um, you know, we were trying to make it work. And the article said, um, you know, about the question that we all get asked, how do you, how do you, how do you manage, how do you juggle? And she said, you know, if you have your marriage, your children, and your work, and your social life, she's like, all of the balls can't be up in the air at the same time. One, two are, two are rising, two are falling, whatever it is. And I think just having that perspective of, you know, at a certain point, the balls that are falling are going to be rising and just being sort of patient. Do you have any? Yeah, I mean, I yeah. always talk about um, overthinking. I'm a thinker, and I'm always, you know, oh, should I have done that? Should I? I've tried to learn not to overthink. And in Wall Street terms, I run my life like a trade blotter. So, you know, when you're working a trade, you know this. We've spent decades you know, on the trading floor. I know. So, so you were a yeah. trader, just I, for anyone watching. Yes. I mean, yes. I worked in finance for a long time, yeah. an investor, a trader. But, um, you know, you have to make quick decisions mm -hmm. and you have to throw money around, right? Like I was at a position trader at one point and it's taking risk, right, on behalf of a firm. So you're like... If you overthink it, you're never going to do it correctly. Yeah. You just have to do it. It's like a gut reaction. Mm -hmm. When we first started Veronica Beard, I got pregnant. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Of course I did because I, there is no good time. You can't plan no. this stuff. You can't overthink this stuff. You just got to do it. And so that's kind of, you know, the I dial. Totally it's like agree. I'm working this trade. It, it's half done. I'll come back to that when I can. Now I got this one. This one's hot. This stock is moving really fast. I got to yeah. sell it. Yeah. You can't look back, right? It's like, oh, I should have sold it when it went. Do it. <laughs> no. I really want to get drunk with you. And just, just, just do just it. Deep yeah, dive right? stuff. Yeah. It's amazing. Like, I love taking a risk. I love making bets because I'm used to it. That's my normal, right? Like, I find the language of the trading floor like incredibly helpful for thinking about life. Or just um, even business overall. Yes. Finance, mm -hmm. like even investment banking. Yeah. You know, supply, demand, and how yeah. you build. It's just, yeah. it's very methodical and like sort of soothing for me. How, like, what keeps you in the game? How do you think about your... Well, someone once said to me before we left LA, um, and she's in our industry too, she said, balance is fleeting. It's Chris Lim, do you remember mm -hmm. her? She said, just remember balance is fleeting. So you're not, instead of chasing this, like, uh, tomorrow, I'm, get, I'm forever, the rest of my life, I'm going to have this balance. You're not. You no. might get it five minutes. You might get it an hour. And even today, I was on a shoot this morning, and I went home to change and do something, and my little one, who's two, was going down for her nap. And so I read her a story and I put her down for a nap. I don't get to do that most days, right. um, but I did. And I was like, yes, that was a really lovely moment, and I'll do it, obviously, later tonight. Right. But it's, and that sounds like I'm trying to do it all. I wasn't, it just happened that that moment made me feel really good, and I, and I enjoyed it, and then I went back into work mode. And so I think it's like little fleeting moments, little like pats on the back, and, and giving yourself a break, which is easier than said than done. So I'm like queen of mum guilt and all that. But, but I do think it comes back to this, like if you're, it's not that you've got it perfectly and you don't have these conflicts in your life, but you're like, I'm coming back, you know, like, and people ask me, mum guilt, do I feel guilty? I was like, ultimately, I, I, I struggle with how I allocate my time. There aren't enough hours in the day, for sure. But if it was a problem, I'd ultimately try and do it differently. And if I keep coming back to the fact that, like, I'm in a really good pattern with, with work and with my kids and my husband, like, then then it's okay. And it's not that I want to necessarily do it this way forever. Mm. And I like love now. about, like, your career change stuff, because I think that's yeah. really, like, powerful. Like, hopefully it's a long life for all of us, and I can do, <laughs> you know, A, some more things simultaneously. I still know what I want to do. Thought. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do when you grow up, right? It. But it changes. It. Right. It does. Right. Thank you, guys. That was amazing. Next up, they say you shouldn't work with family. Well, last week, Charlotte sat down with the identical twin founders of one of the food and beverages' biggest recent success stories. Double Dutch to find out how they do it, plus how they've become such a success story. Morning, 
raised in the Netherlands, Joyce and Race de Haas were at uni when they realized there was a gap in the market for fun, well-flavored mixers. After finding that most mixers lacked the vibrancy of the spirits they were paired with, the sisters developed their now signature flavors, cucumber and watermelon, and pomegranate and basil, and began taking them along to every party. Soon dubbed the Tonic Twins, the pair's joint entrepreneurship master's thesis came top that year and became their eventual business plan. Now, the London-based company sells 750,000 bottles a month into 25 countries. Welcome, ladies. Those are some insane numbers. 750,000 bottles, was that a month? It's actually now 2 million a month. Wow, I was <laughs> surprised. That 2 million a month, that's insane. Like, okay, let, let's take it back. You why you know we've heard a bit about why but like what was the original plan you obviously were doing your masters kind of what what were you thinking you might do when we grew up we always used to make our own soda waters uh because we thought it was a fun thing and we did like flavor development and then we moved to london to do our uh, master degree here and we wrote our dissertation about the whole gin hype and the gin and the fact that gins were massively booming in flavor exploration and that rhubarb gin and crazy lobster gins mm. the choice of mixers was a bit boring so that was kind of the concept of our dissertation. And then we graduated and our university gave us a prize for best thesis of the year. And with that, they gave us our initial investment and a year of free office space and some support around that. So then we thought, this is amazing. <laughs> Let's try it. And then from there on, we stayed in London and built it. Have you always been entrepreneurial? Have you always wanted to do something yourselves? And we always, when we were like very small, like when we were like five, six years old, like on the beach, we would like sell paper made flowers. Mm -hmm. We would like go and get like corn from the farmers and then we would sell it on the streets. So I think we've always had like a little bit of like that entrepreneurial side in us. Talk to me a bit about the journey. So you're at university, you got the investment, it began. How did it then go from, how long ago was that, if you don't mind me asking? How long's the business been going? Uh, 2015. Okay, so we're less than 10 years, you're selling 2 million bottles a month. What's that journey looked like, roughly? We spoke with lots of people and people said like, oh, you either need to choose supermarkets or you need to choose uh, bars. We thought, <laughs> bars much more. Just like knocked on doors, like spoke with bartenders. I was like, can you try it? I think from there, like there was a lot of people that really helped us along the way. It just went from restaurant to restaurant, bar to bar. It's not that there was like one thing that completely game changed everything. Mm -hmm. Except maybe we got like quite early stage, we got like an award from Richard Branson. And I think with that, we got so much press out of it, but we were tiny, tiny. We mm. were mainly, maybe selling, I don't know, 200 bottles a month or something. But people thought that we were bigger and that kind of gave us good credibility and that really helped. What are your core flavors? What are the best selling products? And how do you make them? How do you come up with the flavors? <laughs> and we are always flavor plus a hint of tonic, not tonic plus a hint of flavor. Mm -hmm. So we started with cucumber, watermelon, and bonnet and basil. They are still one of our most popular flavors. Um, and then we have a super delicious Indian tonic, which is a bit more delicate, not super bitter. And all our drinks are double flavored. So mm -hmm. cucumber and watermelon, pongant and basil. In our Indian tonic, we have a hint of juniper berry and grapefruit. Did you start with just those core products? At what point did you start to introduce more? Kind of how did that evolve? People really liked the product, but they said, it doesn't make sense that you don't have a normal tonic because that means that I have to stock your cucumber, watermelon and pongant and basil, but then I still have to go to another brand for my ginger beer or my ginger ale. So we, when we were writing our business plan, we thought that we were never going to do the standard trees. Mm -hmm. But um, I think three months after we launched our first flavors, <laughs> we already had the Indian tonic and light tonic. Quite quickly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, quite quickly. And then we just added to the range and uh, more. a lot of it also from just customer demand. Mm -hmm. And then a part of it is more kind of just doing fun, innovative uh, mm -hmm. things. For example, we launched the Bloody Mary soda last year, which was very different, sparkling, clear. Mm -hmm. What has been the hardest part of your journey so far? building the right team and finding the right people to help the business because I think we never really worked for someone and I think that is quite a struggle to find like the right fit and those kind of things but now mm -hmm. we have a fantastic team so uh, all came came out well. So talk to me about working together as sisters you're obviously very tuned into one another but you know people often kind of issue warnings about going into business <laughs> with a you know family member how do you find the dynamic of working together? I think for us it works really 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 well because I think on the one hand side there is you have 100% the trust is never mm -hmm. an issue you have we have exactly the same vision and I think with that we know each other so well so I think because of that it just it's efficient yeah. you just like say what you want to say you never think about oh maybe she won't like my opinion mm. or whatever it's just it's easy yeah 
It's yeah. true. You can speak to siblings in yeah. a way you can't exactly. speak to anyone else. That's very true. Um, do you each perform different roles within the business? I do everything with sales and marketing and then judges everything with finance and ops and export. Yeah. So you keep it separate. Yeah. <laughs> what would your advice be to other people who are thinking of going into business with a family member? But I think it is definitely more emotional mm. than with uh, a non-family member. Mm. You need to be super passionate about the product or company that you're doing because life uh, like work life balance is so intertwined and mm. it's not a split um which is super fun but i think that you need to think about it <laughs> what is maybe you've each got a separate answer for this the biggest business lesson you've learned along the way just do it especially when launching i think lots of people wait super long to perfectionize a product or service or company and then they launch after a year and then maybe they have to tweak because customer want it differently mm. i think just do it go launch and then along the way, tweak mm. things and change things about it. That's always our founder's advice yeah. as well. La launch with your MVP yeah. and go from there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Joyce? Everything takes time. Like Rome wasn't built in a day. Mm -hmm. And I think products, brands, it just takes time. It takes another decade before mm. you really get like a proper brand. And I think that is the nice thing about having products and a brand. I can't not ask you about bars, restaurants. You guys know them <laughs> so well. Where, where in London do you love? Where do you love to go for a drink? <laughs> Uh, I love Soho House, all of them. <laughs> uh, the Oddly Pub in uh, mm -hmm. Mayfair, super fun pub. Um, course, uh, the Mandrake Hotel, mm -hmm. they have good parties in uh, like Thursday, uh, Fridays. How do you mix your drinks? What's your favorite, each of you, what's your favorite <laughs> flavor and combo? Um, my favorite is still a cucumber watermelon. Mm -hmm. And my favorite combo is with either just a London dry style gin, just super fresh and summery, or as a twist in a mojito. So just white rum, cucumber watermelon. And a mint leaf. Super nice twist. That sounds lovely. Yeah. I'm very up for um, Paloma these days. So mm -hmm. we just launched a pink grapefruit, which is absolutely delicious. Obviously, I think so. But mm -hmm. really, lots of people uh, agree with me. So tequila, some, um, some uh, salt trim on the glass. Add with our pink grapefruit. It's absolutely delicious. Love that. Finally, what's next for the brand? We are putting a lot of effort into launching in uh, Belgium and Netherlands and really building our brand there. Um, we are touching the waters by launching in, in Miami and LA, so in the US, so I think that's very exciting. Where can everybody find you? What's, where's best to shop? It's best to shop uh, in Tesco or Ocado online mm -hmm. or on our web shop uh, in, on doubledutchdrinks.com. Double Dutch. Double Dutch drinks com. There you go. <laughs> Ladies, thank you so much. It was so lovely to meet you both. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Gosh, that is impressive. So amazing when you think a market is saturated. Then they come along, two million bottles a month, right? And what I loved is that when they graduated university, they won best thesis and were given an office for a year. That is very cool. I wish more universities would do things like that. Incubate, yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So you guys are sister-in-law. Married brothers. Is that when you met, when you became related? No, we met before, okay. a few years before. Um, at a wedding, the same night I met my husband, I met Veronica. We were all the si at this wedding. That's and cool. um, it was a very, very serendipitous night. Jamie and I got married. Veronica was still in, working in finance. I was working in fashion. We talked for years about product and designers and all the things that we loved in the industry, all the things that were missing, all the things that we thought we could do better. Um, and constantly came back to this idea of the uniform and this you know, starting with this, the dicky jacket, mm. um, which existed for men, but not for women. And we started with that piece and yeah. grew a business from there. It's incredible. And I'm sure a ride. Have you, you guys haven't written a book yet, have you? No. No, but we took, <laughs> we took a bet Next. on that jacket. Yeah. You know, Did you? every woman needed to have that jacket and it worked for us. We made protos and wore them around and thought, my gosh, this is the Wonder Woman cape. You put this thing on and you slay dragons, you know? And so with that came many uniforms, you know, and the quick fix for the girl on the go. Um, but we always um, push and pull, you know? Like at mm -hmm. first it was like, we were designing together and we have two different body types and we have, you know, just different age and stage. I'm a little older. And um, so, you know, we have different ideas, but at the end, we always came together and loved so many pieces. And she would try things that I would find to be amazing. And I would try things to introduce to stuff that she loved. And it, it's sort of that mix that we always say two, 
perspectives. Two perspectives, vision. one vision. I'm jet lagged. <laughs> but um, it's true. And that mix, you know, she's from the West Coast, I'm from the East. Like, mm -hmm. it, we couldn't be more opposite, but we're both Veronica, like, navigating mm -hmm. this world. You do feel that with this aesthetic of the brand? Because there's everything yeah. from, like, a kind of vintage vibe t-shirt and little crop denim jacket to right. a really slick, like, a, the tweeds you guys make are beautiful. Um, there is a real ver versatility, I think. Is the, is the jacket the one? Is it the absolute staple, the bestseller? Is, yes, always, you know. always. It's, um, but I think, you know, we started with the jacket and then built around that, uh, you know, our denim business was because we didn't have jeans that went with the jacket and that's what we wore all the time. That was our uniform, jeans and a jacket. And then we started our uh, footwear business because we didn't want to wear other people's heels. So um, it's all supply yeah, demand. Exactly. We yeah. want to deliver what you want. We, we think about the customer when we design and we think about how many women can wear this. Where are you wearing that? We're always yelling at each other. Where are you wearing that? Can you hail a cab? Is your, are your abs showing? Oh. Like ooh, how many women want that after that's, childbirth? That's you know, cool. we're always throwing in this lifestyle element because we're reality, you know, when we yeah. want to be your, your everyday wear, your evening wear, your morning wear, your wear to the office, your wear to drop a child off at school. Yeah. You know, how do you legitimize your yoga outfit? You throw on a jacket and yeah. you look ready yeah. to go. I have started wearing a jacket and leggings at work just because, like, if I'm not seeing clients, I look great on Zoom. Right. Like, yeah. super comfy. You just need the jacket. Well, we were, you were just saying earlier, like, workwear no longer exists in its traditional form of it being a suit. And you would be the tale to tell because yeah. Yeah. In, it's a very corporate environment. Yeah. I mean, tailoring's having such an enormous trend moment. So suits that are actually sets are what are selling from us. And people wear them to cocktail parties and to weddings and instead of a dress. And so that, I think the sort of old school suit to work mm. doesn't, doesn't really apply anymore. People wear them, but mm. you can wear jeans and this vest or yeah. this skirt or whatever, you yeah. know, whatever you want. There's not that, that sort of like suit uniform that you have to wear as much. Sydney Carter is a women's basketball coach for UT and she rocks suits and sequins and everything courtside. And men were chastising her for being a distraction. And she flipped it on its head and is a diamond, you know, and she's got this huge amount of followers and this brand emerging because she owns it, you know, and she doesn't think about, whoa, what's appropriate courtside mm -hmm. coaching, you know, attire. I'm a boss. I'm going to wear a suit, you know, and she'll, she's rocked a bunch of our suits and that's not your traditional place to wear a suit, no. you know? No. And so that's what we love too, is shaking it up and wearing a green eye in the day to, to bring out the tennis green in this tweed. Oh, <laughs> Trying different things, you know, and popping something. Tennis green, very appropriate. Yeah. Wimbledon's around yeah. the corner. Are you guys staying for Wimbledon? No. No, we no. leave Thursday. We'll come back. <laughs> um, okay, next up is a bit of BTS. We spent a day with the founder of a female-only tail at the deck, Daisy Natchbull. The first of its kind on Savile Row. She is seriously impressive. Take a look. Hi, I'm Daisy Natchbull, founder of The Deck, and come and spend the day with me. I was very lucky very early on. I had access to this incredible world of this one street with a whole industry on it. Fell totally in love with it. I worked for another tailor on Savile Row called Huntsman. And in 2016, I became the first woman to wear a top hat and tails at Royal Alaska as a kind of publicity stunt to get more women into tailoring and aware of it and actually ended up being the big catalyst for the business and led me to leaving to start my own tailors for women. Please, can I get a, a turmeric latte with almond milk? I bring my own turmeric <laughs> This fuels the street with all their caffeine needs. Hi. Do you want to be filmed? Like I'm, being, I'm being recorded. Oh, yeah. You're right, darling. There's a shop. Good. Busy. Yeah, brilliant. Busy. I love the windows. Thank I you. Love... And this no. man is a legend. Literally a legend on Savile Row. See you later. To Take see it. probably find the best dressed people in London in this coffee shop. I called it the deck because it was based off the fact there are four suits and a deck of cards and we had kind of had four silhouettes that um, women could start from a basis and then kind of design and make to their measurements and stuff like that. It's also the deck because it's about 
reshuffling the way we think about tailoring and prioritising women, putting women on top. Savile Row is a pretty epic place and it's filled with lots of secret little workshops and amazingly talented people who've been here for hundreds of years. Do you remember she wanted to reorder this pair in, um, uh, yeah. in a den? And son who's done the sketches for her. Yes, exactly. Amazing. I think she will love that. Good morning, I'm Jolene, I'm the lead tailor um, at The Deck London. Previously I actually worked for bespoke um, royal families. Um, I used to work for the Queen of England, uh, five years as her dressmaker. There was a special aura about her. She was so kind and she just looked always so beautiful as well. She, had, she, she was just someone so special. It was amazing, amazing experience. And then I moved to Jordan and I was working for the Royal Hashemite Court for Queen Rania. Well, she is the, the youngest and most beautiful queen, I think, in the world. <laughs> and when I first saw her in real, I thought, my God, she is stunning. This is quite a, a different direction. Um, I was really keen to join um, a, a modern thinking company, and I think it's, uh, it's wonderful as well to work in a female-only team. The deck has four shapes, four basic shapes of jackets and trousers. So when the client first comes in, uh, we have a fitting in a fit garment. The clients choose their cloth, their accessories, um, all the design details. And we normally have up to three fittings to make sure the suit is perfect. We are 10% up um, to plan. Uh, we are 30% to our goal for the month. and. Um, we have New York coming up, so let's talk about how we're going to really smash that. Hi, I'm Beth. I'm the COO of The Deck London. Met Daisy through a really good friend of mine. We were talking to each other via Zoom for over a year. And we said, what a great time to open a store in the middle of the pandemic on Savile Row. And after spending a week with Daisy in the store, um, I went back to the States, but then came back a month later and I haven't left since. I've had a long career. Uh, I worked at GC Couture, Coach, Calvin Klein, Armani, and then Bell staff here in the UK. So my experience is across multiple categories, high growth companies. Taking a mixture of everything that I've learned and bringing it here is an honor and a privilege. Finally, excitingly, the shirt, the bespoke shirt offering is now available in stores. As you guys all know, and you've done lots of training on, we're able to fit clients for both silk and cotton shirts, choosing cuffs, collars, everything. It's all done at the front here. And also we received two beautiful printed silk linings this week as well from... Are those created the bespoke by, ones? Yeah, created by an artist. So just to say you can promote that because that was really successful. Mm. And but hi, I'm Jess. I do the quality control here at the deck, um, which is basically where we check the garments. So we do the, the check the label, the embroidery, the measurements to make sure that it fits the client's um, wants and to make sure that they'll be happy with the final seat. So I'm Katie, I'm one of the tailors here. Um, I've been here for two years now. So all of our garments, um, you can choose whichever embroidery. So we do a little branding, ace of spade up your sleeve for the saying, every woman should have an ace of spade up her sleeve. And then you can also choose different things on the linings. So this particular lady has done her and her partner's initials. And you can also do some things under the collar as well. So she's chosen to have the date here. So when she flips her collar, it's quite a nice little touch. It, it's really nice feeling to be able to make something for someone that makes them feel so empowered and comfortable within their own self. So this is um, Ashley's final fitting, so we're looking for any tweaks or final alterations we need to do. But. The waist is really good. Have a seat for me, tell me how you feel when you sit in It feels like pajamas, like yeah. it doesn't feel like a suit. But Ashley chose her initial. You know, you get a suit like this and you wonder why you wore gowns for so many years. Like this is so much more comfortable. And then you can take this off and dance, yeah. right? Ready to go. Now, next time I think we do it in pink. <laughs> it's dangerous. Don't you think? Let's get thinking, Pale yeah. pink. And I've always wanted the perfect tuxedo, and frankly, I've never been able to find one, which is one of the reasons the deck is so brilliant, because Daisy can make anything that you dream up. So when we came in to talk about this, I kind of had an idea in my head, and Daisy was able to really put it on paper, so to speak. When you have something that's truly made for you, you wear them so much more than you wear them forever. Ashley wants a fun, pair of trousers that drape quite well and then a pair that could work for the summer. So actually, I've got a really amazing kind of linen blend here. As you can see, good old dashing tweeds deliver on the craziness. But there are some beautiful, these are kind of heavy linen houndstooths that have just been flying off the chocolate brown. It's my favorite. 
is such a beautiful line. Yeah, I mean the shape in this is fantastic. A QC report which all looks fine. To remind ourselves this is the starting block for a size 10 lady to be fit to be put in. Okay, so we still may have a little bit of work to do on the belt. Uh, but pocket positions, how do they feel? Yeah, I'm really happy, position, much better. Yeah. yeah. But so the yeah, drape the on this cloth is amazing. The hand yeah. is so um, crisp. And the colour's perfect. It's nice. Yeah, I love the colour. It's also not draining. My name's Claire. I am the production manager at The Deck. I worked previously with the founder, Daisy, at Huntsman on Savile Row. I deal with the whole production run from for Made to Measure and Bespoke Pieces trying to keep a steady timeline and production flow with the atelier. So we closely monitor making sure that cloth is delivered to our atelier on time. An exciting part of my role is when we have to speak to new suppliers and develop new buttons, linings and kind of expand the range that we currently offer. So we are so lucky we have a whole array of clients from the woman that saves up for years to the woman that can buy 10 to the 90 year old woman to the kind of 21 year old woman the deck woman is every kind of woman and our prices um for a two-piece suit start at 2800 but you certainly by no means have to have just a suit you could do a waistcoat trousers skirts dresses you know you come in and you you pour over the millions of different swatches of cloth and talk to your tailor so that they can understand your needs do you sweat a lot do you travel a lot do you change shape when you're in your period or you're going through the menopause you're put into what called a fit garment so you can kind of see a mock example and after that we'll see for what's called a base fitting so six weeks later and we reform reshape the pockets aren't put on at this point the collar's half made it's kind of roughly stitched together and then a further six weeks later we see for your final fitting which is where all the final tweaks and adjustments that you've seen of a lot of the clients are made and the finished piece is ready to wear so now we've arrived at Nackley and we're gonna have the most delicious and healthy ish lunch so this is Vix, who is the Wonder Woman of the deck. She's our client relations manager, as well as doing marketing and events. She knows everything about every client there is to know. We're just having a little catch up today about our upcoming trunk shows, most recently being the one in New York and the various events we have going on. Vix runs an amazing program, client loyalty program, which we've just started to, as we've grown, started to instigate to make sure that actually really, you know, every single client feels cherished and, and feels the gratitude from us. It's just kind of capturing all that information from them, you know, their likes, their dislike, how many children they've got, you know, if they're married, you know, what, what job they do, because all that is so important for coming up, like what designs we're going to come up what with, events what events doing. we're going to do. So Wendy, I'm going to taper your trousers Perfect, a little bit. Perfect, thank you. This is the first time I've had a jacket that with the sleeves that are long enough for me. So you're nearly Ascot ready. Almost. Got the hat, the shoes. Just need the bag. Just need the bag. Yeah. Very Jackie O sheep. Well, well, very, um, your emergency exits are here, here, <laughs> and here. <laughs> here for me, I'm, I'm a funny body. I've got very long legs, very long arms. To get something that actually fits me is a kind of game changer. Oh, it looks amazing. I love it. I this love it. Funny. Also, what I really love, I love the, um, oh, the lining. The lining. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Oh, <laughs> love it. So good, you pick really well. You know, so much of what we do is about treasuring an investment piece and making sure that you can pass it down to the next generation and you can wear it time and time again. And actually a massive market that's come out of that kind of idea of wanting to be able to wear things time and time again has been bridal. So many brides are flocking our way to have something beautiful made on their wedding day inspired by Bianca Jagger, of course. And then having it that they can wear it time and time and time again and something that they can pull out and treasure. And we can do things like dye it or change it or you know, alter it in a different way to make it feel like a different suit if needed. So we are in the trims heaven. Buttons, trims, cloth, everything you can imagine. This is our mecca. So I'm in here to try and source a special button for a client. You could be in here for hours and hours and hours. It's so fun. It's heaven. You see they have everything suede and leather. And this is the silk braid that you saw on, on the client Wendy in her purple suit. So we took this edge tape and that's what Jessica did was hand sew the outside edge of the jacket. I took a job on Savile Row and it was actually only when I moved there did I then see this kind of suit, suit shaped gap for women. 
and I was determined to try and make a difference and try and one day have a Savile Row tailor that was exclusively for women where they could come and have their own space and do the same thing men had done for ages. And so I went for about a hundred coffees with everyone that I could ever imagine who then introduced me to someone else and someone else and I wanted to meet people who had had failed businesses and successful businesses and people not even in my, my industry just to really absorb everything I could. I was only 20 five years old at the time. It was really a combination of hard work, luck and opportunity that kind of all met in this perfect moment to help launch the deck. The importance of mentors or, or speaking as I spoke about with these hundred coffees and meeting all these people is there's so many little life advice and nuggets that I've cherished and taken away from those. Building a very strong team behind you is so important. Well, that is a day in my life. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope to see you again soon. What an amazing brand she has built. So fascinating to see behind the scenes and see the level of detail that goes into making a bespoke suit. And by pure chance, you went there this morning. I was. What did you think? Well, I love Savile Row because it's obviously super inspirational for us um, with our business. And I had heard about her store opening and wanted to see it and it was amazing. I was so, I thought it was fantastic. I loved that there was the, the bespoke spe section of the store and then the off the, off the rack. Yeah. It was beautifully tailored. Everything in there was gorgeous. I loved it. Savile Row is like a sort of mysterious old world. Oh, I love it. We walked into Henry Poole. And my dad, when I was little, we lived here. And my dad used to have all of his suits made at Henry Poole. So I walked in and I was like, is Simon here? Who's the, the owner? And they're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Switching gears to giving career advice, and I'm all ears at this point. Um, what advice would you all give to somebody who's on the cusp of making their side hustle their main hustle and I assume you guys have all been in that position. I'm probably in that position right now with a yeah. homewares brand. I have ultimately found that all the stuff I do on the side has been the massively supportive tool to my main career. It's made Agreed. me realise how much I'm in the right space for me with my main career, how much I love corporate, how much I love trading floors and like that vibe and it really suits my skill set. But it doesn't, it can't be everything. I think it's really hard for, we have this expectation for our works to deliver so much. And it's helped me understand like what my work is, what it, what it can deliver to my life and to like go out and find the bits that I want beyond that. I would say um, Philippe Lafont taught me, <laughs> he always said this when we were growing Co2, yeah. do not build a stadium before you, you have the fans. And we use that a lot. It's like, let's see if this works and then um, grow from there as, as they demand it. But the other thing is, um, if you're passionate about something and you tailor it with love, um, it's all about the finishes, it's all about the thought that goes into it. And a lot of these businesses, you know, if they're getting bigger and they get dumbed down and they lose that edge, we get customers that return constantly because it fits well. Mm -hmm. And it's about the things that you don't, it, it's not just the visual, right? It's like she puts it on and she's like, I never felt so good. It's like getting your makeup done after a long flight. <laughs> it's like anecdotal for your mood and you know, you can feel like you're ready. So it's like in anything you're gonna do, just do it from your, your heart and, and your interest and it's never work and, and you can monetize that. But was it a big, were you afraid to leave like yeah. finance and trading and like, or did it feel like a very natural decision in the end? I, um, I had to, I had my third baby there you know, being pregnant on a trading floor intense, is like yeah. intense. <laughs> After the third, my mother and my husband were like, you're done, you know, and, and you're done. I, I was like, yeah, I'm done, but I, I like needed therapy because you can't come down, right? And um, so sitting at home, you know, for a year, raising four kids, you're like, is this it for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you need something yeah. for you, you yeah. know? You know what, I find so much, um, I'm such a creative, like that is, I'm, I'm energized by creativity and newness and I get to, you know, interiors is a huge love of mine. And so with our stores, that's something that I get to like flex and be creative, you know, on all of these different stores. Um, I love our new categories, designing into new things. I think that that's like really, so those, those for me become these like little, side hustles where I really get to research and understand product and 
and sort of dive into all of this. It feels like a new business every mm -hmm. time, which is so fun. And I think that that keeps it very new and fresh for me. But have you had moments where you're just terrified, like towards the beginning? You're oh my off, God. Jumping off a cliff. Is yes, it, but was you it? know what? It was, we always say that we didn't know what we didn't know. Yes. And so that was sort the of the ignorance is, is bliss, you know? I mean, we were yeah. like, okay, we'll just, we'll do this. We had, you know, a rack of jackets of samples made. We were in my apartment. I, you know, had worked in fashion, so I knew buyers and I knew people in press and, you know, we could get people there. But we were like, let's see if this is going to take off. And then at the end of that, that market, which was two weeks, we had eight accounts and one of them was Saks. Wow. And so then we had to go make these clothes. And, and there was a hundred percent sell through that yeah. first season on that jacket. And so that made us go, wait. And then we were like, wait, this is a Dickie concept going to take off. And our stores had the jackets and they had multiple Dickies and they called and said, we need more Dickies. Like, wow, people are buying one jacket and multiple yeah. Dickies. Like, this yeah. is a concept that might work. Just and explain so, the Dickies, the insert. Right? Yes. Inside. So yeah. it's layering, yeah. no bulk, mm -hmm. and it zips here. Interchangeable. Yeah, and they're all interchangeable. And it's one size Dickie goes in any jacket. Um, so we had to think all this stuff through. <laughs> and um, maybe you're feeling like you want to look like a downtown, you know, fashionista. So we made a, a moto Dickie, you know, out of leather. And then yeah. we make an upstate Still Dickie. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. have our, our mm -hmm. core Dickies, you know, the, Dickie, the Fisherman Hoodie knit. Dickie. Yeah, the Terry All Hoodie the is great court size. Or you don't have to wear any Dickie. You know, when you're watching a kid's so soccer cool. match. Wait, Honestly, I want to know about your leap now, though. Oh, God, well, yeah. I'm sort of there at the moment. So 18 months ago, as you, you were kindly one of my first I was one of your customers. first customers. I will never forget. <laughs> you were one of our first customers. <laughs> well... Thank women you. support women. Yeah, but I yeah. remember seeing yeah. the order and I nearly cried because Aww. that's a really good deal. I was so deal. excited. I was like, well, like wicker. Three pieces of furniture. <laughs> um, and I launched 18 months ago. And I'm, I'm doing two full-time jobs because one is still a startup, but that creativity and passion and sort yeah. of the, the absolute um, non-negotiable to compromise on any kind of... Uh, you quality. Know, quality. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And what, it, what I sought out to begin doing, um, I feel very proud of, of the product. So even though it's terrifying on a day-to-day -day basis, literally, um, I'm very excited. So I'll and see. it looks so, so good. Great. Thank you. That's it really does. The product is so good. Congratulations. Thank yeah, I you think guys. you have a real knack for it. Yeah. Oh, well, I enjoy it. Thanks. And I love <laughs> I'm following you for years. You know, you're a huge influencer too. Oh, yeah. yes. That's are. really kind. Thanks, guys. Well, this is a really lovely show. Oh, so love going on. That's it for today. Sadly, I could sit here all day. Thank you to Veronica, Veronica, Thank Rebecca, you. Thank you. Daisy, Joyce, and Rassia. Next week, Charlotte is back with a summer style update with Polly, plus outside dining ideas with Alexandra Dudley, plus more behind the scenes action. And in the meantime, we would love it if you could comment below, give us a thumbs up, and do subscribe if you haven't yet. Have a lovely day. Mwah.